Shalom. Oh, Shalom, you can hear me. You can hear me. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Hi, Ricky. Hi. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Who Hi, else Judy. is here? How are you, Ricky? I'm good. How are you? You Mazel look great. On the newest addition in your family. Thank you so much. <laughs> Who else is signing in? Susie. Susie is signing in. Charlotte and Carol. Oh, you've got to press a lot of buttons. Yeah. There she is. It took me. It took There's me a while Carol, for some reason to get on. Don't ask me why. Hi, Susie. Hi, Susie's Charlotte. The Hi, everybody. Susie. Susie's the furthest away, so that's why it takes longer for her to get on. Oh yeah. <laughs> why did it take long? Uh, why did it joke. take a while for me to get on? I don't know. That's something technical, a glitch. Yeah. It's, <laughs> to err as human, to really louse things up, you need a computer. Right. Yes. Yeah. You know that's uh, well said. Yeah, there, there, there are a couple of things that, you know, aren't from the Jewish tradition, but are filled with uh, wisdom. That one and uh, Star Trek Four. It's the one is... bureaucracy. It's the one constant in the universe. What's the one about bureaucracy? Bureaucracy. It's the one constant in the universe. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good term. Let's think about Hashem's bureaucracy as it's set up in Tanakh. <laughs> Meaning the creatures upstairs, not the ones he puts down here. Okay, right. so you know that's a, I like that phrase though, the heavenly bureaucracy. You know? Yeah, that, well, that's, that's also to uh, think about. the kiddos chim. That's what they hold most of the time. Right. Yeah, I like it. Okay, so um, Again, we have got a uh, parasha that is just uh, filled with uh, material, uh, partially because we have two parashiot, <laughs> Nitzavim Vayelech, and a number of important ideas that come through this parasha. First of all, the notion of Teshuvah, that we can turn back to God, God will turn back to us, and uh, obviously very important for the season, particularly since this parasha always comes in the midst of the Amim Noraim. Uh, we have uh, new leadership as Moshe has to appoint uh, Yoshua, and uh, we still have what has been a sermonic. Chapter 31, verse 17. Yeah. And we uh, have a great deal of, um, you know, ongoing uh, homiletic uh, <laughs> comments, the sense that... Uh, Moshe is warning the people of their uh, possible disobedience to God and the consequences. Uh, you know, it's just uh, and just some remarkable lines in our uh, parasha. But I'm going to focus on one, which gave rise to a great deal of theological speculation. It's actually not something that's that unique to our parasha. Uh, it's called the notion of hastarat panim as we can see from the verse here, which is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 17 to 18, really, I'm just focusing on 18. Vanochi aster astir panai bayomahu, and I will surely conceal my face on that day, um, for all of the, well, they translated here, um, uh, because of all the evil that they have done, kifana el Elohim acherim, for they faced about to other gods. That's Fox's translation. They turned to other gods. So God is going to hide the divine face. And uh, appears elsewhere in our parasha, but it also appears within the writings of the prophets and throughout Psalms. In fact, it's uh, very much part of the psalm that we've been reciting in this uh, penitential season, Psalm 27, we'll come back to that. This whole notion of hastarat panim, God somehow hiding the divine face. And that kind of stands in contrast when we think of God's blessings. What's, let's take the most famous blessing of God that the Kohen yeah, yeah, has. Yeah. This yeah. is the opposite of your Hashem Yeah, let God's face shine upon you. The exact opposite. And we'll see that. So first of all, we're, we're just going to be jumping around until we get to some more modern commentaries, because th th there are many different approaches to, uh, to this uh, notion. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say I never read uh, 
Buber's uh, late work, um, The Eclipse of God, which uh, to some extent touches uh, upon this. Um, but let's just take a look. First of all, the Talmud, Chagiga. Uh, who would like to read? I will. Thank you, Susie. But I, I will conceal, yes, conceal my face on that day. Rava said that the Blessed One, Hol Blessed Holy One said, even though I hid my face from them, nevertheless, I speak with him in a dream. Rav Yosef said, his hand is outstretched, guarding over us, as it is stated, and I have covered you in the shadow of my hand. Okay, so we have to figure out what is the Talmud's problem here? What is Rava um, and Rav Yosef? What are they? What are they trying to say? What are they? What's their problem with this verse? They're saying that the verse said that he's concealing himself. You know, the, the upper verse that we read, mm -hmm. he's concealing himself, but. They say no, he's not, because he speaks to uh, to him with him in a dream, and then Yosef says his hand is outstretched, guarding us. So even though he's turning his face, he still cares about us. Yeah, um, I'm not so sure it's good a second one means what the translation says it means. But usually, the Adonijia is not protective; it's negative. You know, it's, it means that, you know, it's it's ready to hit you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's, you know, that's yeah. just Rav Yosef's words. The verse that he quotes, it would say, the opposite message from the one that Rav quotes, yeah. you know? Uh, and, and uh, okay, but I, I like if you could explain in context what's Chagiga talking about. Because I know the first chapter is talking about going to Yishalayim to see Hashem directly on the regular. Yeah, um, there's a whole, the, the whole notion that, you know, we read in the Torah that we have to make an appearance before God in the Beit HaMikdash. We have to be seen by God. So there is a sense that, um, you know, one experiences God, one sees God uh, in the uh, temple. And, you know, I can unpack that, I it's not. Well, I mean, that's what it says, Rabbi Papa. You don't yeah. have to unpack it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it means you go see God in the temple. That's yeah. what it says. Yeah, you bring your, uh, you know, you have a specific yeah. sacrifice for that, as you mentioned, yeah. the Olat Re'iyah. And you can't Literally. come by, by the right time. You can't do that without bringing a sacrifice with you. Yep. So, you know, otherwise, um, it's, you don't even bother to come. Yeah. So I'm sorry to say that there are uh, numerous uh Tseva Adom um warnings being flashed through Israel uh in the Galil. It's not good news. Anyway, um but it's also not unexpected news. No, no, not at all. And uh so again they're struggling with this notion of God is I'm going to conceal myself, but does God ever really conceal himself? Does the divine ever really turn away? You know, and, and that's a whole question. You know, does God you have to read uh, Richard uh, Elliot Friedman's The Hidden Face of God? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to come to that. We're going to take a look at a section from that. So, um, but th but that's that's a fundamental problem, uh, you know, theologically, and you know how we understand the power of God in this world. You know, is uh, in uh, so in Harold Kushner, Lev Shalom, his uh, famous book, uh, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. You know, he's willing to give up on God's omnipotence, even God's, um, well, uh, not so much God's omniscience, but certainly God's omnipotence. So, you know, God doesn't cause the bad things that happen. You know, they happen and God suffers along with the person. Um, and then those that would totally disagree with that and say, no, 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 no. Like Isaiah says in the actual uh, verse, as opposed to how we have uh, kind of uh, lightened it in our uh, in our Sidor, 
talking about God is Yotzer or Uvarei Choshech, who fashions light and creates darkness, Oseh Shalom Uvarei Atara, who makes peace or makes wholeness or uh, wheel. There's no X in it, Rabbi Paki. It's Uvarei Ra. That's Uvarei Ra, and creates, sorry, and creates. I'm th I'm thinking of the uh, the tefillah where it says, yeah, it says Tako. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah, no, but you're right. Uvo Ra, Ra, who creates evil. So you know, it's a it's a theological argument, and already uh, we see that our rabbis are you know have a, maybe a different perspective than the uh, biblical text. Pardon me. Oh, oh. Love you. Bless you. Thank you. So let's go on to Ibn Ezra. How is he? explaining it the meaning of what i i will conceal yes conceal is if they call me i will not answer scripture compares god to a person who does not see or know what is happening it is the custom of scripture to employ two verbs those who know grammar understand this yeah, you know, he's you know uh, Ibn Ezra is also grammarian, and he's emphasizing the fact that it says haster astir. It doesn't just say astir, but haster astir. A very common uh, biblical style for emphasis. Yaro yare osakol yisakel, talking about the punishment if somebody encroaches upon Mount Sinai, um, and uh, many many other examples. Uh, but aside from the grammar, uh, how is he explaining this? This is Hastarat Panim. He's just according to the plain posture of the most Yeah. The way it usually well, we understand it. If you pray, you know, you're not going to be answered. Not, you're not going to, in, in other words, Hashem is not going to pay any attention to your prayers at all. Okay? Right. So you might as well save time and not pray. And that, that kind of idea is all over the time. Yeah. So, uh, it's just that, you know, God is simply not going to pay attention. Not, it's not that God doesn't know or can't act, um, but God is deliberately not going to pay attention. Ignoring, period. Ignoring, yeah. Period. The so, first person who suffered from that punishment was Cain. When we panecha esater, the first murderer, well, I will call manslaughter. That's, I think, a little bit more accurate. But you wait. He shed blood and and uh, and he says right off the bat, Gadav onim in the soul. I can't deal with a punishment in which umi panecha esater. So right. from that so, point on, the term is used all the time to get across the fact that somebody who's in that state and Hashem isn't going to do any kind of intervention to get them out of any kind of you know mess they get themselves into, no matter how much they pray. Right. But I so, don't understand. Isn't this the exact opposite of what we believe God to be? That he knows everything and sees everything? Oh, he sees it, but he doesn't do he's gonna do anything about it. You can pray yourself to that that's the point. In other words, your prayers simply are not going to cause God to in any way, you know, come around to what it is you're resting for. But it we're is, told to pray to God. Yeah, because all of us are told to pray to God because we have no way of knowing which among us has God decided to hid his face from. So for everyone, there's a default assumption that prayer is going to be better, better for them. But the Tanakh makes it clear there were certain people who committed such awful sins that God wasn't going to pay attention to their prayers no matter what they did. And the first person is the man who, who murdered his brother, Cain, killed Eva. And then just here in our that parasha, the first, that's all. Yeah, and here are our parasha. It's uh, it's 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 the shot that, you know, the people have turned against God, and uh, it's a terrible sin, and God is just not going to pay attention to them. And you know, uh, this is hardly uncommon. That, you know, one of the great ways to. Uh, to, if you will, hurt someone or punish them, is to not pay attention. You know, everybody wants attention. You know, like the little kid who's on the diving board or in the, the monkey bars or whatever. 
Mommy, Daddy, look at me, look at me, look at me. You've had a whole book full of warnings. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and it continues even in this parasha, you know, it's like... (laughs) First of all, the, the whole notion of ingratitude that, you know, after all I've done, this is how you behave, but also just, you know, hear are the terms, you don't well, live up to the terms and you, you don't get the blessings. There are consequences. Yeah. Well, and, I'm talking, in, in this particular chapter, this is the, uh, the book has started. We haven't had a single situation other than a telling off a story where Hashem actually speaks to Moshe at the age of 120, not stories about what Hashem did when Moshe was 80, okay? This whole thing starts with Ben Me'avi, Esrim, Shanaan, or Piyayom. The speech is over. The speech that started in chapter one and ended at the end of chapter 30 is over, okay? Now Moshe is getting ready to die. These last four chapters are just an appendix. In the appendix, Hashem speaks to Moshe directly, but specifically about things that have to do with the transition to Yehoshua. Pretty much that's what it is. You're going to die, Yehoshua's taking over, and in the very last chapter, 34, it makes it very clear what the, you know, the appendix is about. Yeah, but, you know, it's still, it's, it's the background of all of the Varim that uh, is coming here. So let's take a look at what Sforno has to say. One more. But I, but I, I will conceal, yes, conceal my face, not as they thought when they said that I was no longer in their midst, but wherever they are. My presence will be with them, as our sages said, as every place they were exiled, the divine presence went with them. However, I will conceal my face from saving them. So he's explaining really with that last line. So is God leaving them, according to Sforno? No. 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 But, but he's still ignoring them. <laughs> right. He's ignoring them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's... So he said, you know, I'm still with them. You know, God doesn't disappear. But, you know, this is, I'm turning away from them. Um, I think, like you said at the beginning, you said a very good statement. What's bothering them that they write things like this? And I think what's bothering them is they simply don't want to accept what the Tanakh is saying point blank. You know? It's a polemic against the Tanakh. How dare the Tanakh say something that God's going to hide his face and ignore people? You know, the chutzpah. So we're going to get around that by, you know, modifying it in some way so it doesn't Mm -hmm. look as bad as it says. Yeah. But what it says is perfectly clear despite these steps. Right. Uh, I'm not, you know, (laughs) and well, as we'll come to, that what we are is we're talking about a relationship. Uh, but we'll come to that. Let's just take a look at a few more of these comments. Here's Sifte Chachamim. Ah, as you do this one too. Okay, you're stop. you stop fooling around with it. Yeah, yeah. As sorry. if I wait, as if I do not notice their suffering. This means that hiding the face is the absence of his supervision. For one who does not see something does not watch over it. Again, um, but this is also uh, an issue within Jewish theology. Um, hashkacha. Uh, the, I, I the translated term watch over it is bad in an English translation. Oh. It really means doesn't pay attention. Pay attention. To it. Yeah. Yeah. So my, he's using the term mashkiach, which is the same term as used for a kashrut supervisor, um, as paying attention. And careful uh, attention. Careful attention. Um, and the uh, you know part of the question is you know what what is there a limit? What is the extent of divine hashkacha? In other words, is there hashka? I mean, you can understand God looking over the whole world on you know kind of a national level or you know a, a cosmic level. There is hashkacha from God. Is there hashkacha pratit? Does God pay attention to the individual? 
okay, we can understand God, you know, controlling the whole cosmos, but is he going to pay attention to one uh, Pintle Yid? Well, that's not what Pintle Yid really well, means. Who's but... supposed to be answering that question, the Tanakh or the Rambam? Because if well, you're looking at the Tanakh, you're going to say, God will pay attention to every individual only if the individual is worthy of attention. Right. That's the Tanakh's answer. I'm sure that's not the Rambam's answer. Yeah, probably not. But that not. is the Tanakh's answer. But it, I mean, it's, I, I, this becomes an issue. Um, let's see. I just want to find something here. Well, I'll, I'll come back to this. Um uh, in terms of uh, uh, coming from the stone humash, but yeah, it, but it's again the sense that God is just not going to pay attention. It's not that God isn't there, and then they're struggling with this notion that what could God not be there? Could God, you know, is you know, is there a limit to God's power in some way? Uh, and uh, they're saying no. Um, but also what's driving them is not only the words of the Tanakh, but their own experience. So who would like to continue here? This is Rabbeinu Bechayai, Bachia. Here at the top of the page, any volunteers? But I, I, I will. Okay, thank you. Charlotte? But I, I will conceal, yes, conceal my face on that day. God has already, had already mentioned earlier I will conceal my face from them. This refers to the exile in Babylon. Now, when God returns to hiding the face again, and in more emphatic language, it announces to us this hiding of the face will not be a short period like the first, will be a but will be a long period of hiding the face. It alludes to this exile that we are living in, an exile twice as long, However, we have comfort from another place in the Torah, in the promise. Yes, and yes, even then, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn them. I will not repel them to finish them off, to abrogate my covenant with them. For I, Hashem, am their God. Yeah, so for, uh, you know, he's picking up to some extent uh well not to some extent he's picking up on the language of the bible and one says you know god will hide his conceal his face but then haster astir the much more emphatic language so for rabbi nubachia it's not just a general discussion but it's also very specific so the first time it's ref it's referring to the experience of exile because in exile we feel an absence of God's presence. And you know certainly there was the one in Babylonia but that ended you know certainly by the time the middle ages when he's writing it was long over. However, <laughs> the exile by the Romans initially has continued. So this is a very long period of hastarak panim. Yet he's not totally giving up because, you know, he's reading the Torah as a whole. We have also in Vayikra, and this is the end of all the blessings and the curses after all the horrible things that God is going to do to them. Nonetheless, even in the land of their enemies, I'm not going to totally forget them. I've got a covenant with them. I am still their God. So, you know, he's mm -hmm. to some extent not just explaining the verse, but trying to give, I imagine, comfort to some of his people who are living uh, in uh, in Europe and not really uh, not having a good time of it. Um, I don't I don't remember his years. Uh, Let's find out, because this 1335 certainly sounds like he's thinking in in. in late 14th century terms. Otherwise, why is he putting it there? You know, yeah. what's the connection between this? I mean, the Daniel verses, you could stick it to anything you want. That's yeah, exactly well, we didn't, the uh, we didn't get to uh, Daniel yet, because uh, go well, on. But now. that's why you asked about the time, wasn't it? Well, to some extent. Yeah. Okay, so um, but also just remembering exactly. if he's living... Uh, so he's living after the uh, First Crusade, and uh, oh, you know, well after the First well after the First Crusade. How, how 
close as he could expulse her from from Spain. That I, Let's that find I out. We'll find out. Okay. So go on, Charlotte. This verse reveals to us the length of this divine concealment. This is the numerical value of the words. Aster, aster. That's the Hebrew. Okay. Aster, aster. That if you uh, add up the numbers, you get the number the num being eleven, being thirteen thirty six. This corresponds to the word word of Daniel twelve twelve at the end of his vision. Happy the one who waits and reaches on. 1,235 days. <laughs> yeah, so at the very end of Sefer Daniel, um, he, he talks about uh, the uh, punishment is, you know, 1,235 days. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know if this is actually, he's thinking of this as... You live from 1255 to 1340. Okay. That's the Hebrew Wikipedia I'm reading now. Uh, okay. So um, it's, uh, you know, he could be referring to 1336, but it could also just simply be that from a particular point, it's going to be this many years. There were, um, within Jewish tradition, many who tried to kind of calculate the time of uh, the coming of the Messiah. The rabbis were not crazy about that. In fact, they have a pretty powerful statement that, you know, blast be the bones of one who tries to calculate the end. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the reason is that you don't want to get people's hopes up when there's no guarantee. And also you have a lot of crazy uh, messianic movements that say, oh, this is when it's go. This is what's happening. And it causes problems. Um, but it, it could be that, you know, he's uh, thinking that, aha, we're getting close to the end. I mean, no, uh, it's not just the Middle Ages. We have that today. I mean, turn on some of these uh, TV evangelists or before them the radio. You know, there are so many people, uh, you know, we're we're on the cusp of the Messianic age. Listen, we've got them in our own tradition as well. Uh, so... <coughs> You know, but now he's speaking more to their experience, like, oh, my God, we are feeling this hastarat panim. We feel as if God is not paying attention to us. Um, of course, you know, then there's the, Jew, the joke from uh, you don't have to be Jewish. God, is it true we're the Jew chosen people? Yes, Mr. Bernstein, you are the chosen, chosen people. Well, would you mind choosing somebody else for a change? You know, maybe God's hashgacha is not uh, what we always want. But but seriously, it is. Um, but that's not what chosen people means anyway. No, that's of course not. We talked about that last week. I yeah. mean, that's just. Uh, the joke only works if you believe in fantasy of the chosen people being something special. Not right. what it means to being, you know, chosen to have more obligations. Right. Yeah. No, of course, that's not the shot of the text. Although, you know, we don't that notion isn't totally um, absent from Jewish tradition. I mean, the, the whole notion of the suffering servant uh, in Christianity comes from Judaism. It happens to be an idea that we just never really accepted, but uh, or held on to. But certainly, we have it in the Sefer Yeshayahu, um, and then there are other sources as well. Uh, and, you know, even to some extent, uh, at the end of uh, Amos, when he says, listen, you know, don't think you're going to escape punishment. You're going to be punished even more so because you have not followed my commandments. So it's not totally absent, but obviously, as we talked about last week, this isn't, you know, that's not the notion of the chosen people. But still, now I apologize. I didn't uh, have a chance to translate Malbim. So I'll do my best. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Zucker and uh, Yehudi, you'll correct me. Uh, so he's actually commenting on a verse in Psalms. Like I said, the notion of Hastarat Panim appears again and again in Psalms. So the full verse is, Ad ana Adonai tishkacheni netzach, ad ana tastir et panecha mimeni. How long will you forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will you hide your face from me? 
that's just translation from uh yeah uh davka it's not necessarily anyway so he's commenting on the words ad anna for how long avon yisovev lifamim shichacha sin can cause uh at times forgetting velifamim yisovev hastarat panim and sometimes it can cause divine concealment ashichacha who uh sorry i just have to move everyone a moment um who ate higdil bechet kol kach ad she salek Hashem mashkachato mimenu mikol vechol? Um, the forgetting can be a time in which the sin is so great that until God um removes the divine uh, supervision or or paying attention, the careful attention uh, from Him uh, from everything, vaaz lo yativlo velo yera. Um, then God does nothing to benefit him, a person, and nor anything to hurt him. Just, you know, Ahu Masur El Hamikreb Bechol Inyanav. He is just given over to chance um, in all matters. Bahastarat Panim, and this divine concealment, who beit Yashkia Hashem Alav, Laha Anisho Al Avono. But uh, really, the Hastarat Panim. Is a time in which God, God does pay attention to him to punish him for his sin. Sha'az eno shachuach etzel ha'elyona. For then he is not forgotten uh, in the uh, careful attention from above. Rak shall onesh ha'hashgach. Rather, the the supervisory punishment, <laughs> you know, the uh, punishment that comes from paying attention, is hidden uh, and concealed in natural, uh, not natural tools, but in natural ways. Sheyan nishu al yedei oivim um ikim uchedome, in which he is punished by enemies and ma'anikim, ma'akim. What is that word? Me'ikim, and it's a biblical word. It means people who want to cause trouble for you. Okay, all right. You know, I, I just wasn't sure it sounded familiar, but uchedome and the like. You know, it, it just happens. He doesn't really understand the source. So when he sees these things coming from around him, he, uh, it seems to him that all of these bad things are coming to him by accident or through nature. And it only seems to him that God is hiding his face from him. But the one who conceals his face is one who sees the matter, but is not seen, uh, you know, hmm. from it. V'chein Hashem mashgiach az al ha'adam, uh, so God is really uh, taking note of, paying careful attention to the person. Uh, he doesn't recognize that the punishment is really a divine punishment. So he's saying the first half of the verse, is, the person is praying, but the psalmist is praying um, the, regarding the first one. And the Allah Shaini, he is praying for the second one. So, Yudi, before you answer that, how is um, Malbim trying to deal with this issue of Hastarat Panim? Again, he's not necessarily paying it to, well. I mean, Basically, it seems that uh, for, for Malbim, uh, God is always paying attention, but mm -hmm. you just don't realize because 
you, you you don't feel that God is there, but God it really is there, even though you don't realize it. Yeah. And, you know, it's almost like the opposite. God may be concealing his face, but God is still there. I mean, that's how God conceals. You know, you can only be concealed if you're there. Uh, Yehudi, go ahead. I just want to point out that we have to see that the reason the Malbum is doing this is because he's got a certain fix about how biblical poetry works. And he thinks it's always a staircase. So the result of that is mm -hmm. that he can't live with the idea that the two halves of the verse is simply saying the same thing in different words. He has to basically make the second half say something else. But that's not the shot at all. The, in fact, if anything, this verse is an excellent verse to show you what exactly the Tanakh thinks Hashem Panim means. Yep. It means that Hashem, you know, not forgets about you, ignores you. That's what the Shachach means a good deal of the time in Tanakh. Yeah. It doesn't really mean to forget. It means more like not care about, you know? And so, in other words, this is a perfect example of what we call biblical parallelism, synonymous parallelism. And a mob of doesn't base it. He's got his own sheet of it. Every time you see something like this, it's a staircase. And the next verse is more of a staircase. Then it goes on to say, in Psalm 13, I don't know, or should they tell for not she are going to love your mom? Now, sometimes the Malvin Shita works. The best example is High Guys Kote, I'm Kevin Ramon, a seven step staircase going down to the worst thing, the Zoroachar. But when you try to apply that to every single time you have parallelism, you end up with interpretations that are appealing on, on the face of it but they're off the wall in terms of understanding what the chat is. In other words, I want to know what Tanakh, Tanakh has to say. The Malvin isn't helping me. If anything, he's putting in something that Tanakh would never say. Yeah. and But also we see that in rabbinic literature. You know, no word, uh, certainly no phrase, could ever not, be not extraneous. About the hill. They'll say that about Tawachot in the Torah. But you'll never see Midrash Tehillim, you know, the uh, what's called Shocher Tov, going on and dealing with a verse in Tehillim, which is absolutely mm -hmm. the number one parallel book in the whole Tanakh, it, yeah. you know, in that kind of a fashion. They simply don't do that. They'll do that with Hatei Takeh or, you know, Lotu Chala but it, it, it's quite different when you get to, 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 to verses that are in Nach. In those verses, they don't they don't play those games. And they Although, even in the so-called biblical parallelism, um, there is a sense that, uh, I mean, the parallelism, the, the two phrases can be, in fact, parallel, or sometimes they are like a staircase. One builds on well, the I'm other. Everybody gets the idea, Rabbi. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm just, it's no, a, I know, I realize that. It's basic, but it can't be applied to every single parallel. Right, right. That's all. Yeah. So, but again, just another way, you know, there is they're struggling, you know, with understanding this and not in any way implying some uh, weakness or uh, incompleteness on the part of the divine. So uh, we mentioned before how this is the opposite of the bracha. Um, uh, uh, go on, Charlotte. This is from the new JPS. Uh, hide my countenance from them. Withdraw my favor and protection. Abandon them and ignore their pleas for help. God's face is his attentive presence, as in the priestly blessing. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face to you and grant you peace. I have to tell you, I have to stop right here. When my son Stuart was a bar mitzvah, Rabbi Whiteman said this prayer to him. Yeah, well, and it's a prayer I that just, we recite uh, over yeah. our children every Friday night and at the it's, holidays. It's a beautiful and, thing. Yeah, yeah, so we often use it at B'nai Mitzvah. We use, yeah. uh, we use it at weddings. I just uh, so, uh, had to say it because yeah. mm -hmm. it meant something to me. Yeah, when God you. hides his countenance, he is exposed and unprotected. The same idea is expressed in the poem. I will hide my countenance from you, from them, and see how they fare in the end. Yeah, that's coming up in uh, Sefer Devarim. So again, just uh, he's just explaining the pshat here. Of, uh, you know, and, and also to show favor 
is, um, you know, generally lim tzolchein, to find grace uh, or favor, um, but also to pay attention to someone, isapanim. Um, that could be that can also be uh, in terms of judges that you should not show favor. Uh, but uh, the idea of like lifting up the face, you're paying attention. And, you know, again, I mentioned, you know, the kid who's on the diving board or in the or doing something wants his parent to look at him when the parent isn't uh, looking at them. Or today, you know, someone is on the phone. You know, and we want that person to look at us, to pay attention. You know, don't bury your phone. Don't bury your face in uh, the phone or in the TV or, you know, whatever. So uh, Rabbi Zucker mentioned an article by uh, Richard Elliott Friedman, uh, where he talks about the biblical expression, Mastir Panim. Um, and it's been, you know, I, I'm not sure I've ever, ever read the whole um article but i sort but it was it's a, a long time it's ago. a whole book yeah, I have yeah that's true but um i want yeah i certainly didn't read the book but i just tried to bring out something that uh he writes that is uh useful um, what does that mustier mean mustier means to hide hide your face okay yeah hostier panim I, I do want to sorry let me just uh jump ahead a moment to um psalm Oh, well, while I'm here, I can do it. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to have to move everybody a moment. Um, to Vim, uh, to Hilim. So here is the uh, coming up. This is well, uh, here in the English. Um, sorry, I really needed the Hebrew. Uh, this is the psalm that we're reciting at this period. Um, psalm of David. You know, what's really interesting, if you look at uh, verse 5. For in time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Um, under the cover of his tent shall he hide me. Uh, uh, and he shall set me up in a rock. Uh, Yastireni, he will hide me the same root. But uh, then you go down to nine. I mean, a fascinating psalm, which is you know, taught in the past and, you know, worth examining because it starts off seeming, the psalmist seems so confident, but as you move through the psalm, he's not, the psalmist isn't so confident. And he says, hide not your face from me, put not your servant away in anger. You know, so it, I think there's a, a deliberate play that on one hand, God can protect him, can hide him away as an act of protection, but the divine could also hide itself. And that leaves one uh, terrified. Uh, uh, elsewhere in the Psalms, he started the fanecha haiti nivhal. You hid your face and I was terrified. So let's go back to our text. Okay. Um, uh, go ahead, Charlotte. Do this Deuteron one too. The narrative of Deuteronomy 31 does not portray the events which are to follow the hiding of Hashem's face as his doing. It is not suggested that Hashem will be the active cause of Israel's suffering, but rather the evils and troubles are themselves the subject of the clause. Cause. Did you mean cause or clause? Clause. Clause. They will find the people because our God is not in our midst. Mastir Panim thus stands beside active divine chastisement as an additional and more terrifying dimension of Hashem's response to Israel's infidelity. It is one thing for a parent to punish his child severely. It is another for the parent to place the child in a situation of pain and distress and then to leave. In the first case, despite the immediate pain, the bond of the parent and child remains unbroken, and neither the parent's that should be love. love nor his loyalty is necessarily challenged by his action. In the latter case, the child is lost, has nowhere to appeal for help, and meets pain and terror simultaneously. Yeah, so he's uh, kind of... Um developing more finely, you know, the notion that uh, of Hasterat Panim as 
as a kind of divine punishment that uh, in some ways is uh, more terrifying when you just don't know where it's coming from. So um, I just want to conclude. There are some selections here from Arnold Eisen, um, one of his pieces for Torah from JTS, you know, the weekly thing they send out. And uh, it's called Love in Hiding. Um, and would someone else like to read this? I can read, Rabbi. Okay, thanks, Ricky. Commentators throughout the ages have had a lot to say about these verses and the concept of the image of God, God's hidden countenance, has taken on added importance in our generation, having been invoked by a number of theologians struggling to make sense of, or in the face of, the Holocaust. Yeah, and just uh, one uh, quote, um, when God's back is towards man, history is Auschwitz. Very, very powerful uh, statement. There's also... Uh, Norman Lamb used that in a sermon. So, yeah, we, we've heard it quite a bit. Anyway, going on. Rather than abandon belief that God has the will and consciousness needed to act in history or blame God for causing or allowing the evils perpetrated by the Nazis to occur or find ways to justify God's alleged action or inaction during those years, the theologians throw up their hands at the question of where God was while the awful work of the death camps proceeded. It hiding of the countenance is a sort of explanation that asserts no explanation is possible. It is a way of saying, we do not know. We have no answers. Why, despite the existence of a God who cares about the world and is merciful, do natural disasters wipe out entire villages? Why does cancer strike innocent children? Why do human beings created in God's image murder other creatures of God by the millions? Why does God do nothing to stop them? We don't know. We lack answers, but we will not declare that God never acts, never saves, never speaks, never hears our cries for help. Instead, we talk about the hiding of the countenance and transmit a divine promise that if we act as we should, the hiding will come to an end. Yeah, kind of like uh, <clears throat> what we saw above that uh, on one hand, um, there is a hastarak panim, but we have the verse in Levit Leviticus that says, you know, even if I punish and do all these horrible things, you know, I'm not abandoning you. I will still, uh, I'm still your God. Go ahead. Go on. That is the yeah. second aspect of the hidden countenance, <clears throat> excuse me, notion that I treasure. Rather than articulate abstract theology, it testifies to the power of relationship. Moses is taking his leave from the children of Israel in these chapters. God, too, is announcing a leave taking in this Parsha, the consequences of his Israelite worship of other gods. The rabbis compared the situation to a king who regrettably banishes a child from his presence for a time and lets the child know that he is doing it out of love and will one day welcome the child back to the palace. God is, Sorry. God is not breaking off the relationship with Israel forever, but warning in advance that it will be disrupted for a time and then repaired. The lover will be absent, but the love will continue. So long as the hiding continues, so should the seeking. One tries in vain to make good logical or theological sense of the matter. It does not satisfactorily explain any bad things that happen to innocent people in the presence of a good God who cares about humanity. But the notion of the hidden face resonates powerfully with emotional truth. It speaks to the absence of someone we love, the fear that they will stop loving us, and the comforting promise that they will be there even when we cannot reach them and will never entirely leave us even after they are gone. I think um, Arnie Eisen here really captures the power of this notion of Hastarak Panim, that, you know, why it has had such resonance throughout our tradition that 
ultimately, you know, God is not paying attention, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't care. The relationship is still there, even if we feel that God is absent. And, you know, I, I think the whole emphasis, and this is, you know, contemporary theology, uh, much more, emphasizing much more the notion of relationship uh, between God and human beings or God and the Jewish people. Um, I don't think it's only modern. I mean, I think that comes out of Tanakh, comes out of rabbinic literature, comes out of uh, mystical literature, poetry, you know, this is... But let's go on with uh, what Ar Arnie writes here. The Baal Shem Tov beautifully addressed that dimension when he distinguished in his commentary, say for Baal Shem Tov by Yelech 4, between the hiding of the divine countenance, announced the first time God uses the phrase in our Parsha and the hiding of the hiding, which the Besht. Besht. Yeah, Besht, that's the uh, abbreviation Baal for Baal Shem Tov. Believes is oh. the import of the second mention of it in verse 18. I read his teaching this way. It is bad enough when someone we love leaves us hides from us, causes us to seek long years without finding. But that loss is bearable because we know that one we love is there to be found. Buber, for that reason, spoke of the eclipse of God. The sun or moon is blocked for a time, but we know it is there and will return. Should we doubt either of these things, however, should we give up on the lover's existence and so on their love for us, that would be truly unbearable. The children of Israel are warned by God that this too will overtake them for a time. In the depths of their alienation from God, but it will be temporary and they can carry God's words in their hearts. They can fill public and private life with God's commandments. And Moses' words too will be ringing in their ears, our ears. We compare that, we can bear the hiding of the countenance for a time and come out the other end in a renewed relationship. I just thought that was a powerful piece that he wrote. Um, and again, the uh, I think understanding the, uh, the poetic possibilities of this notion of hastarat panim, that, you know, whatever we do with it theologically, you know, <laughs> sometimes it works much more on an emotional level. Uh, but, um, you know, it just it, it picks up on a lot of the things that we see in the commentators. And it's just, you know, it has been such a powerful phrase and uh, worth uh, going into detail and exploring. And, you know, we can't help but uh, face this. We're the generation following the Shoah. Uh, and uh, we're coming up to a, a certainly, and we've known this throughout our history. Uh, you know, just uh, two months ago, we commemorated Tisha B'Av. And uh, of course, we're going to have the Ela Ezkara, the uh, so-called martyrology that is part of our Yom Kippur liturgy every year. And this year, almost uh, on the uh, first yard site of October 7th. So... The notion of hastarat panim is not just for theological speculation, but also can speak to us in an experiential and emotional level and something to think about as we uh, read this parasha. Any other questions, comments? I just think yes. our Sorry. idea of time and our idea of time is totally different. I mean, you know, to us, a hundred years is a long period of time. To God, it's probably like a second. Yeah. And the pain that we have to go through, I mean, God may say, well, you know, it's a short period of time and temporary, but to us, it feels like a lifetime. Right. And we may not see the end of it. So, I, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of like when people say, God never gives you more than you can handle. Yeah. Well, the problem is God knows what we can handle. We may not always be aware of that. Um, but there is uh, a sense, like even, you know, in the Haftarot that we read over the past seven weeks, um, it talks about, uh, you know, the, the, the notion of Hastra Panim, Beshetsef Ketsef, a beautiful Hebrew phrase, that like, you know, just for a moment, 
he started to I, you know, I, I hid my face. But then, you know, for a great amount of time, I will take you back. You know, that's, uh, I mean, I think also, as implied by some of the Mepharshim, the notion of Hasterat Panim, you know, God knows when the uh, reveal will happen. Uh, we they don't. say it's all relative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but, uh, Yasha oh, Kokocha, I gotta run, but uh, Yasha Kokocha. Uh, okay, and okay, well, just let us know. Are you going to have a session the Thursday before Yom Kippur? Because we're no. not having any sessions on the holidays themselves. Right. But the Thursday before Yom Kippur is a regular weekday. Yeah, no, and but we're, we're not going to have Zeno or something like that. No, we're not going to have any class in October. We'll resume in November. Okay. Well, you're not going to have one on October 31st either. When is the 1st of November? On a Friday? A Tuesday. Um, no, October no, or November. November. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. No, we should, aside from the Chagim, we should only be missing one day. Okay. Very All good. All right. So, in the meantime, should I not see anyone? Because, no, we're still, yeah, but just be well. Have a good Shabbos. Thank you. And don't forget it's Slichot uh, Motzei Shabbat and some fasting material. I hope you'll have a chance to look, uh, watch, and listen to the podcast, uh, read the article. There's a lot to talk about. Unfortunately, uh, anti Semitism, you know, we, we have to be aware of all of the places it's coming and what's going on. So take care, everybody. Thank you. Wishing everybody a sweet and peaceful New Year. Yes. Happy and healthy New Year. Shana Tova Metuka. Lecholacha to everyone.